the 22 fire companies that got closed. 22 firehouses in the city of Boston were closed. And this happened in the suburbs too, but you'd have one, maybe one firehouse and you'd, you'd lose half a dozen firefighters uh, laid off, but uh, they focused on Boston itself. And they thought Kevin White, the mayor of Boston back at the time was using the police and fire as pawns. So, when they concentrated on Boston, you see these yellow pins, that's just the first 107 fires they set. And look at the concentration in the city itself. And they just barely make it out to the uh, Southwest suburb and the ones at the top of the screen are Cambridge, Revere, Everett. And, uh, but they concentrated on the city of Boston. The very first fires, now they actually started breaking windshields with bricks first, and then they started shooting the windshields out with a pellet gun. But nobody paid attention to that. They said, if we do this, the police will have to write report after report and can't investigate serious crime, we don't have time. So they said, the only way we're gonna do this is by setting some fires. Now, if you're familiar with uh, the Charles River and Storo Drive, if you're riding on Storo Drive and you look to the Boston side, you're looking at the rear of these brownstones that line um, the river. And the back of those have dumpsters. Every one has a dumpster. These guys took a simple device and tossed it into dumpster after dumpster after dumpster. And they got 20 or 30 of them lit up in one night. They'd go across the river to the Cambridge side and they'd watch and they'd listen on their own scanners these guys drove mock cruisers. We call them, we call them uh, Nerf cruisers. And then the Nerf balls, the soft little uh, squishy balls. Well, they had their Nerf cruisers, their own cruisers they rode around in, the black uh, LTDs with the black walls and the uh, whip antenna or the Chevy sedans. And they rode around in those because they wanted to act like cops even when they're off duty and not working. Uh, the security people did it. Um, uh, the Boston firefighter actually had arson on his license plate. That was arson was his plate. And he fooled some people with that. And you know, if you're riding through these neighborhoods, residential neighborhoods back then of Dorchester, Roxbury, Charlestown, Southie, Jamaica Plain, et cetera, in the middle of the night and you pull over and get out and you got a couple of white guys on the streets where there's largely black neighborhoods or Hispanic neighborhoods, they would automatically think you're detectives, you're cops. I mean, who else would be foolish enough to be in some of these neighborhoods in the middle of the night? That's what, that's what people would think. So they set these fires in Boston after the dumpsters didn't get people screaming, even in the somewhat wealthy area back bay. Uh, you know, the citizens just didn't scream loud enough for these guys. So they started setting fire after fire. Their first building fire is this one here. It's in Roxbury. And as you can see, it was well underway by the time the fire department got there. Uh, they haven't even put, started putting water on it yet in this photo. Um, they used a device that was a little more sophisticated than the simple device that they use in the dumpsters. And I can tell you people nowadays, back in the 80s, I probably wouldn't have told somebody the device because I didn't want to teach people how to set fires. As a matter of fact, Greg Bemis learned how to make this device in a fire academy class. Um, it, but today, it not only was it in my, it's in my book, it was the court case back then. It, and the internet tells you how to make anything. So. Uh, I'm not giving away anything by telling you that they walked down the street with a little brown paper bag, a lunch bag, and in that bag they'd have a plastic baggie, a Ziploc with Coleman lantern fuel. On top of that, they put a little tissue, and then as they placed the device, they would take a matchbook and interlace a cigarette, lit cigarette, in there and place it in the bag. And that cigarette as it burns down, we'll hit the matches, ignite the matches, the paper, and eventually the fuel. Um, with that little device, they used it for almost all 264 of these building fires. They graduated and they added something later, which I'll 
I'll give it to you a little bit later. So the favorite targets were abandoned buildings originally. You can't drive through Boston and see hardly abandoned buildings today. Now some of the storefronts are empty because of COVID and everything, but property values are so high, there's no vacant lots virtually in the neighborhoods. Uh, anything that was there that was old that might have torn it down and rebuilt, but property values are so high today, you don't have what they had in 1982 where you had so many abandoned uh, two and three families. Now, a three-decker, a three-story, three-family could be six families in there. Um, I used to, in my book, you'll see I switch back and forth between three-decker and triple-decker. Uh, a good friend of mine who's a retired firefighter is also a uh, spark, a uh, fire buff himself, he said, he said, don't call them triple deckers because that's a sandwich. It's a three decker, not a triple decker. So they, they would go and hit these targets. Now, each one of these targets virtually had something else in common. Very unusual, built in the 1940s or so, a lot of these buildings. The outside siding covering was what we call gasoline shingles. It's the same asphalt shingles that's on the roof of a lot of houses. It went all the way down the sides to the ground level. So they placed a little device up against the building. And I'm telling you, you could light those gas shingles with a lighter and it'll be up at the roof line in a matter of just a couple of minutes because that burns. It's just solid gasoline, basically. That's all it is. They would also go inside these buildings because they're all torn apart, there's trash dumped in a lot of these buildings, so they could set the fires that way. Pay attention to the building on the left, the uh, four-story brick. Uh, you might see that again later if I time showing it to you. That's the same fire, that's a different one. So February 18th, they set their first fire, their first building fire, 1982. Coincidentally, the federal government had gotten into fire investigation. And we used to have to prove that there could be an explosion. You either had to have a device that could explode or pour some gasoline in the right quantity in the building, and we had to show that it could explode if it didn't. In 1982, Ronald Reagan changed the federal law. If you damage or destroy a building by means of explosive, explosion or fire. He added two words only, or fire. And we had the jurisdiction, ATF did. Cities around the country were burning furiously. Uh, Boston had a heck of a history of fires. New York City was burning, the Bronx was burning, Chicago and LA, four cities that they put task force. The very first week of March, 1982, two weeks after these guys set their first fire, we didn't know about them yet, but the arson task force was formed in Boston and I volunteered for it. I had worked some undercover cases. I had a 46 machine gun case in 1980. Um, I was buying guns off the streets of Boston. I, the night Elvis died, I was buying guns off the street in Boston in 1977. But I knew I wanted something different once ATF got serious about the fires. So I volunteered and started taking fire classes. I now have over 3,000 hours of training. I have personally, uh, this is my confession, folks, but confessions don't hold unless you have corroborating information. My confession is I have set 100 fires myself, training fires. <laughs> okay. But uh, you got to prove it, folks. say this program took a turn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like my confession, but uh, you got to prove it just like we had to prove it in this case. Um, so um, I volunteered for the arson group and working with Boston Fire throughout the spring of 1982, these guys geared up. They started setting multiple fires in one night. Uh, June 11th, 1982 was the busiest night in Boston Fire Department history. Uh, there was 11 multiple alarm fires, 10 of them set by these guys in one night. Now Boston has a multiple alarm fire, maybe one a week. Uh, these guys were setting two, three, four, and more 
in one night, up to 30 or 40 in a month. And uh, Boston Arson Squad was busy doing the fire scene. I, in 1988, I graduated from a two year program where I became a certified fire investigator and I spend my time uh, investigating the origin and cause of where, uh, where it started and how it started. And uh, I became an expert at doing that over my last uh, 35 years or so. This particular fire is June 3rd, 1982. And the reason I'm showing you this is, is uh, at least twofold. They were starting to pick up on a number of fires. It was getting pretty good press, but it wasn't, still wasn't big enough. Um, they set this fire right in that walkway or alleyway between the two buildings. And they place a device up against that building that's in all flames. And you can see how well it's lit up in that alley. What happens, it, cre it creeps up to the uh, roof line, it goes into the attic, and it goes into the upper floor windows. Uh, this is on Dot Ave, Dorchester Ave, um, only a few blocks from the expressway. It's a multiple alarm fire because of the closeness of other buildings. You have to, uh, it might have been a three alarm fire that night. But they graduated to setting commercial buildings on fire. Now, the abandoned places, part of the reason they set them was firefighters probably wouldn't have to rush in and get hurt maybe because they're abandoned and people typically aren't living in them unless you had a homeless person who chose to live in one of these buildings. And we had no information ever that actually a homeless person or any other person was squatting in the building at the time of their fires. But this fire started changing the whole category of the investigation. Blue Sparrow Toy Company imported inexpensive, cheap toys from China, uh, stuffed toys, plastic toys, all in cardboard boxes on pallets. 1,000 feet long the building, over three football fields, 300 feet wide. You can only see small portions of it here with the smoke and the way the pictures are taken. By the way, Bill Noonan was a Boston firefighter and became a photographer for 30 plus years. He gave me permission to use all his photos. He has his own photo book out. Um, and I see him on Facebook all the time. I never had Facebook. My Facebook doesn't say Wayne Miller. It says burn Boston burn and, and I have LinkedIn um, now too. And I've made so many connections around the entire country on LinkedIn, which I just started uh, November uh, a year ago, uh, 7,000 connections around the country and it's almost all police and fire. Um, and I, I sell a lot of books that way and meet a lot of people. So Sparrow Toy Company, happened on June 3rd, 1982. And let me tell you, I worked that scene the next few days and we had the national response team. Now, let me introduce you to the NRT, ATF national response team. There were four, there are four teams in the country, uh, Northeast, Southeast, Midwest and Western teams who responded to large incidents with either large dollar loss or loss of life or large injuries, uh, a great amount of injuries, any place in the country within 24 hours. As a matter of fact, they've actually, uh, they have an international response team too, but the NRT actually went to Puerto Rico for the DuPont Plaza Hotel fire. I went there in 1986 on, we were notified on New Year's Eve and at 8 a.m. New Year's Day, I was on a flight to Puerto Rico for the next eight days when 97 people died in the hotel fire. Um, so the national response team came to Boston for the very first time for that fire on June 3rd. They arrived on June 4th, which uh, was Friday afternoon. And um, we started working that scene by Saturday morning. And it was one of those miserable days, sort of like we had a couple days ago with that cold mistiness, um, 40 something degrees, even so it's June 3rd, 40 something degrees and you're, you're only a few blocks from, from the ocean because this was, that was in Southie that fire. And uh, it was just one of those cold miserable days to work a fire scene. Uh, 
we found out exactly where the fire started and we knew somebody said it, um, even so it was such a huge fire. Um, what I'm showing you here is uh, just part of the indictment. Mm, the conspiracy eventually charged eight and then a ninth person. So we, we actually had multiple indictments because we got more information after one person confessed and we had a superseding indictment. And this is a list of uh, the fires. Um, you can see number 25, June 3rd is actually the E Street. That's the Sparrow Toy Company. Now Sparrow Toy didn't employ a lot of people because it was a warehouse in a sense. Um, they had like 26 employees, never reopened in Boston, moved to New Jersey with the loss of all that taxable money to the city and state. Uh, you can see June 11th, we only had four fires that we put on here, but uh, there were 10 fires that these guys set that night. We got those later on in the superseding indictment. Um, and the next page, June 25th was uh, one of those spree nights, from number 47 to number 50. Uh, my second daughter was born that day. Now, imagine you don't have cell phones back then. You, you're working, um, you're either working in a sense or you're not working. And I had a one-year-old daughter and the newborn and my, my wife. And I hear about all these fires that happened that day. So, you know, while they're taking naps, I'm on the phone calling the office, calling Boston Austin Squad, uh, seeing if we can make this investigation move any faster. On any one day, we had maybe 18 suspects. And any one day, we took two people off that list and then included two more people on this list. Uh, just look to the left side here. Again, it's four fires on June 11th that's listed here. But the third column says nine, nine alarm fire on Brookside Avenue, um, Washington Street, six alarm fire, uh, Sydney Street, three alarms, and Center Street and Jamaica Plain, five alarms. That's all in the same night. So what's that do when you uh, lay off 600 firefighters and you close 22 fire companies? It spreads your guys real thin and it makes them real tired. And they face fires like this because they're delayed at one fire. They can't get to the next fire. What do you think this chief is doing? Do you think maybe at one point he shrugged his shoulders and said, what do I do with this type of thing? We have uh, three stories at least here. Yeah, fully, that's really fully involved. A lot of times you hear the term fully involved. This is a full, fully involved fire. This building was so big that they actually set this one a second time another day. And you got the chief, I don't know if he's on the radio. Yeah, he is. He's, he's actually on the radio. He's not smoking a cigarette. <laughs> a lot of firefighters back then smoked. Same building. I don't know if it's that first fire or if it's the second one. Closer view. Still the same building. Now the reason I this is says uh, this is a Norwood engine. Why am I showing you a Norwood engine? Norwood is to the southwest of Boston. It's probably uh, 12 miles from downtown Boston. And Norwood was the first engine to arrive at this fire, the Sydney Street fire, which was the last fire that night. It was actually discovered by the chaplain from the Boston Fire Department. He's the one who actually called this one in. And my biggest supporter from the Boston Sparks Association was WBZ cameraman for 40 years, Nat Whittemore. You're gonna see his videos in a minute, at least a portion of them. And Nat was in the city that night and he sees engines coming from out of town going in the wrong direction, heading to a fire. So Nat, because he worked for a uh, TV station, he could actually have uh, lights and siren. And he put them on and stopped the engine and directed them back to this fire um, because these guys didn't know where they were going. Uh, you didn't have GPS back then. Uh, try to find Sydney Street, folks, on a, on a map. It's tucked in a little bit. I love this picture. Silhouetted firefighter with an empty hose. You can tell that hose is just uh, flaccid at, at the uh, time of shot. 
and you got three stories fully involved. They set that particular fire in the basement on the, just over his uh, right shoulder. And uh, we have exposures. He's not going to do anything to help that particular building, but uh, maybe save exposures once he gets water. This was a daycare at some point. This is an interesting fire on January 1983. Now, that's almost a full year of setting the fires. We fire investigators are running from fire to fire. We don't have a good suspect, except by late November, and I'll show you late November why we ended up with a eh, some suspects, but this is January 1983. The upper floor here is actually the Boston Sparks Club. This, these guys set fire to that. And two of them, two of the nine guys in this conspiracy were members of that club. Two other guys got denied multiple times. Donald Stackpole, the owner of the security company and the Boston firefighter, Ray Norton, because a lot of people just didn't like them. They were crass, they were nasty, mean individuals. The two meanest guys in this entire group. And so they got vote, voted down often. So they hated the club and they hated club members. So they burned it. Now, they have since reopened, if you know where the Boston Fire Museum is today, right near the uh, Children's Museum in Boston, Congress Street. Um, the Fire Museum is only the next block over. It's a great take. It's free when it's open. And I don't know if it's still open, if it's open at all with COVID, but uh, it's free and there's a lot of old equipment in there. And they lost quite a bit of stuff in this particular fire. Multiple views of it. I actually looked at this one earlier today. <laughs> Here's a, imagine if you lived up on the upper floor and you had to come down the fire escape with the flame going from one <laughs> level to the next. Uh, again, God bless the firefighters. Um, my second wife, who I've been married to for 25 years now, um, her father was a fire captain in Revere just outside of Boston. And her brother was a fire captain in Revere. And um, the, she knows what it's like for them to work out in these types of days. Her father worked the blizzard of 78 and he didn't come home for six days. And some of the stories that she heard about him being out there. And um, again, you know, you're out there in those super hot days and getting heat exhaustion or you're out there in these days. Uh, freezing and everything, you, your helmets and everything else freezing. Let me put on a video for a minute. Oh, there's that four story brick. They set that a year after they set the first fire, which was across the street to the right. That very first one I showed you. Um, so we still didn't catch up on these guys. I do want to show you a slide coming up. What time is it there? Um, it is 719. So, okay, we got about a half hour. Mm -hmm. um, this is a church in the South End. Amazing photograph taken by Bill Nolan. Can you imagine that 100 year old stained glass window up there, that big giant circular opening? Now forever gone because these guys set the building on fire. Flames shooting out there. These guys wanted the people to know. It was in the Boston Sunday Magazine. It was in newspapers. There were all types of people. There was, uh, you know, people from Northeastern, people from uh, different backgrounds, guessing. Uh, I think maybe uh, the black kids who were during the summertime, they were setting the fires because they were bored. Or maybe it was the landlords, uh, gentrification type of thing, setting the fires. Uh, but so it wasn't clear. Mr. Flair became a name that we don't we don't even know the origin. And I still talk to Greg Bemis today. Um, I meet Greg every couple months, and we have a meal together. Uh, we talk on the phone every couple months. He took this name, and this is something I don't like the press for. You know, every single bad guy who's been around, Frankie, uh, Frankie, the, you know, Salemi, 
the rifleman, um, you know, bank robbers, they get special names, uh, that type of thing. And it's put in the newspaper and put on TV constantly. Let me tell you, these guys eat it up. The bad guys eat up that press. Greg Bemis loved being Mr. Flair. And he didn't make the name up. He doesn't know where it came from. The Friday Firebug came out from the newspaper because they were setting their fire. The first pattern was early Friday mornings. So they called them the Friday Firebug. Then they started breaking the pattern to other days of the week because we were out doing surveillances with Boston Fire. And we actually caught another arsonist in the process of set multiple fires on Thursday night and Friday morning. There was a single guy who, um, who had uh, drinking issues and he got paid on Thursday and went out drinking on Thursday night. And when he's heading back home, he sets fire, but uh, had nothing to do with this crew. So they sent this particular letter that Greg Bemis himself, just like an old Hollywood movie, he cut out all the letters from magazines and stuff, and he taped them and pasted them on here. I'll read some of it because you can't get to some of the smaller print. I'm Mr. Flair. You know me as the Friday firebug. I will continue till all deactivated police and fire equipment is brought back. Down the bottom, it says, if abandoned buildings are torn down, occupied buildings will be targeted next. That is a threat letter. That is just like if you call in a bomb scare or something like that. It's a threat letter. It's another charge that can be charged federally or state. As you can see at the very top, there's actually an exhibit number on there from federal court. This was used. Now this gets sent to WBZ because Nat Whittemore and WBZ really covered these fires. They wanted it to go on TV. Instead, BZ called Boston Fire, who came and picked it up, and brought it over to Boston PD, who fingerprinted. You can see some of the discoloration, particularly down in the bottom, because they fingerprinted this letter. They come up with a couple smudged prints, nothing usable, and they put it in a file drawer. We were working every day with Boston Fire and Boston Police, and we did not know about this until after the first guy confessed in this group. Okay, so I'm gonna escape out of there. Let's see, stop share. Let's and looking see. at those buildings, it's even if they aren't occupied, it's, it's almost humbling because you see like, it's just how, what fire can do. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, they knew what they were doing. And let's see if I do that. That's not up there, is it? Um, yep, I'm seeing Burn Boston Burn Talk 2, and it looks like it's set to the moment you. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So, by that actually the wrong date that was put on by somebody else, it's actually October 2nd. And the important thing, I'm going to shut the sound down on this. Important to the October 2nd. South Boston during World War II was a big military area. They, they had uh, uh, training exercises, housing uh, thousands of military people. This is an old wooden two-story structure that still existed in 1982. And Bobby Gavlowski, the Boston cop, and another of the Austin's boosted them up to the second floor window and they put a device right inside one of these windows. They thought it wasn't taken off. They looked at it. Oh, it, show you how crazy these guys are, okay? They called in a bomb scare at Mass General because the bomb squad was headquartered directly next door to this building and they wanted them to move. As soon as they moved, they set this building on fire. Show how brazen they are. Sending that letter was another thing. So this fire changed a lot of how we focus because 22 firefighters came to crashing down when that wall on roof crashed. They had broken backs, broken legs. 
burns. As a matter of fact, uh, this particular, my the story of my book was on Chronicle. You guys have New Hampshire Chronicle. We have uh, Chronicle here in Boston. And uh, it was a full half hour episode. And I tried to get the gentleman who's being carried away now, Manny Gregorio. I tried to get Manny to uh, take 35 years after he got hurt. And he couldn't. He, ha he still has uh, post-traumatic stress. And he can't deal with going through this story. He's being caught away in the ambulance there. Now, they had hurt firefighters before. Sparrow Toy, 33 firefighters got hurt, but none of them were real serious injuries. Nobody, uh, uh, nothing life threatening. In this case, it, it, I don't know how guys didn't die in this particular fire. So that's October 2nd. Now they talked about it the next day, this, the members of this crew. Uh, I'll let, I'll just let it run for a minute and you can look at that while I'm talking. Um, they talked about it. They said, we have to be more careful. We didn't want to hurt these guys. Well, two, two days after that, they were out setting more commercial fires, buildings on fire, which could have collapsed again and could have injured or killed firefighters. October was the third most prolific month. I told you they set up to 40 fires in a month. I think they set 30 in the month of October. And that has to be most of them after October 2nd. Uh, this particular fire, Polaroid, they put the vice. Now, they changed the device a little bit. I'll show you in a second. They put it where you see the three columns to the right. And this had gas shingles. This had shingles all the way down to the ground. They put a device there and it raced up towards the roof line. Polaroid lost $5 million worth of equipment in this old crappy building. Again. Okay, you're looking at steel treads and the base of a tire. In Boston, there were tires thrown in all these vacant lots. Today, most of the time you get them taken care of when you buy new tires, uh, they take, you know, for a couple bucks, they take them away, that type of thing. Well, back then, people threw them wherever they could throw them. This is a old friend of mine, Ed Fowler. He worked for Cambridge Fire Department, and this was in Cambridge. He's showing the chief there. This is the evidence you find after you set a fire using that device with the tire. Now, I know I, I went to one scene in Canton, and I saw the same exact thing. And this is how we started connecting these guys to fire after fire when we started finding the steel belt remains. Um, so here we are in October, and we still don't have a good suspect. And we're well up to 120, maybe 140 fires in that time period. So these guys, they knew the fire department operations. They knew which firehouses were closed. They knew who normally gets called first for a fire. They would steal fireboxes. You know the fireboxes you see on pedestals or poles, utility poles inside the building? Well, Boston had those all over the place back then. And they were actually call boxes. You open the door and you could actually call the fire alarms and say, we got a fire on Quincy Street. And um, you'd actually talk to a person. Well. They stole those. Now it's not, you're looking at a lot of people here. It's not unusual. Spectators don't get to see fires every day. I mean, you, you know what it's like when there's a car accident on the road, everybody gawking across the highway and slowing traffic down. Well, you get a lot of spectators and you get the fire buffs. The fire buffs waited for calls to come in. So they stole fire box after fire box. 14 of them were missing that year. Um, what fire? Okay, I gotta pause it here just for a second. 14, wait, pause. 14 boxes were missing. Normally Boston loses one a year. These guys not only collected them as memorabilia, but by taking a box away and somebody's driving at two o'clock in the morning through Dorchester, in a residential neighborhood, how are they gonna report fire? Now remember, this investigation couldn't even happen like this today. Uh, you didn't have your cell phone, you didn't have GPS, uh, you didn't have security cameras around every corner, people's doorbells these days. 
So this investigation could never happen the way it happened back then. You couldn't, even if you had these guys as suspects, which we did eventually, you couldn't follow them. They were police and fire. They were trained. They knew in the middle of the night, if you're driving through these neighborhoods, how are you going to follow them type of thing? So what happened in November, this Garrity Lumber Yard, uh, Hyde Park, um, Dedham Line, southwest corner of Boston. And it was called Garrity 2 because a month earlier they had set a previous fire and it, it looked similar to this one. Um, I went to both fire scenes the day after. This here, they put two devices in that building. They got dropped off by two members of the crew and they ran through the field and they put two devices, one in the shingles, one in the uh, plywood area. And you're actually going to see ply plywood doesn't burn too well, like a telephone book actually wouldn't burn too well either. But uh, as you can see, it progressed and took the roof right off the building. Now the importance of this fire is what's, what you're going to see in a, in a minute. And I'm gonna put the sound back up. I'm not sure you're going to be able to hear it too well, but with me narrating, you will get the idea. Nat Whittemore is there with Ed Fowler. They were good friends as well as fire buffs themselves. Matt Whittemore is filming this. This is his film. He comes around the corner and he hears a group of boisterous guys watching the fire. They were rooting for the home team. The home team's the fire guys. The visitors are the firefighters. Okay, that was Boston police officer Robert Kablewski who pulled his gun out. He reached across to a shoulder holster and pulled a handgun out. He's off duty, he's got an army jacket on, hanging out with his buddies. The uh, lump in the middle, squatting down on lumber pile was Donald Stackpole, who is forever housed in the Braintree Cemetery uh, today. And to the right hand side with his arms crossed is Greg Bemis. He was the youngest one of the crew initially until 1983 when Donald Stackpole ran the security company. One of his employees joined the conspiracy, Mark Spenby. He was a little bit younger than Greg. Greg here is uh, 22 years old at this point. Um, yeah, he just turned 22. And um, you see Grabluski to the left of your screen, turning his head to the right. I'll play this for a second. Okay, you see a gentleman with glasses and he's looking to his right and he's hiding his head right now. That was Joe Gorman. Joe Gorman grew up as a fire buff. His father uh, took him to fire when he grew up growing up. Um, he was a rigger down at Quincy Shipyard. And they looked to the right because Ray Norton, a firefighter from Boston, was sitting on another pile of lumber but never got on film. What happened with this particular, why this fire was so important? Let's see. I'll just stay here for a second. It was because we knocked on the door. My partner, Billy Murphy, uh, and I knocked on Grabluski's apartment door a couple of days later. And he was there and he invited us in. He lied straight face, straight to our faces. Uh, he said, I'm just a fire buff. These are my friends. I don't know anything about fires. Uh, you know, we went at them, law enforcement to law enforcement. We identified a couple people in that group. Now, the cameraman knew a couple of them, but didn't know all of them. And Ed Fowler knew some of them. And they had gut feelings that these guys were wrong, that these guys were probably setting the fires or something. But 
you know, to be truthful, Ed, Ed Fowler said the board up companies, the people who bought up the buildings after fires, he thought maybe they were arsonists. And, you know, that so and so and another guy and another guy were the arsonists. And so, but you have to have evidence. And with this film, we went to WBD studio the next day. They did not show this on TV again. They showed the fire, but they didn't show the crew. And we identified Grabowski and a couple others. We knocked on his door. He lied to us. But on the floor of his living room was a firebox. And Billy puts on his, his trench coat that he wore all the time as we're getting up to leave. And he said, oh, my, my grandfather used to make lamps out of these things. And Billy just wanted to get a little bit closer so he could read the four-digit number on the front of it. And it was box 1712. It was the very first box missing in 1982 from Roxbury near where that first fire was set. By taking the box off, there would be a delay of reporting the fires. And you set one fire in this neighborhood, set another fire close by, and fire companies have to come from greater distances. So every minute that you delay getting water on the fire, the fire grows exponentially. So they knew what they were doing. But with that box that was on the floor of Grabowski, we got a search warrant with Boston PD and served the warrant. He wasn't there when we went in the second time. Boston PD had wanted nothing to do with it. They talk about, you know, taking care of your own and stuff like that. They said, why are you going after our guy? You know, that type of thing. We got the box and they said, okay, we're out of here. No, the warrant says we can look for it anything that might be related. You know, we can go in drawers and everything else to see if there's paperwork relating to fires and stuff. So, but Boston PD wanted us out of there. We spent another few minutes, we argued a little bit and we didn't find anything else, but he got charged with receiving stolen property. Well, big deal. That's a misdemeanor virtually, you know. Um, they took his gun away and they put him in dispatch while they had an internal affairs uh, investigation. Bobby came in and took a polygraph exam, a lie detector, with an attorney, and he flunked it horribly. That was the first week of December 1982. We didn't get a chance to talk to Bobby again until January 1984, 13 months later. Now, what the heck are we doing throughout 1983? Well, you know, life gets in the way, there's other investigations, and there's continuing fires in this investigation. But we knocked on the door of some other people associated with this crew. And I knocked on the door of Wayne Sandin, lieutenant in the Boston Housing Authority. Wayne, you're a cop, I'm a cop, you have two kids, I have two kids. And, you know, man to man, what can you tell me? I really don't know anything about fire. They, they set one of the cars on fire that was stripped. You know those stolen cars that are abandoned, stripped, the tires are gone and everything? They set one of those on fire. I, I know that, but oh God, don't, you know, that didn't do a thing for me. I got a big yawn for that. And eventually Wayne said, you know, I'll tell you anything I know. And he said, oh, they set a car on fire that caught onto a building. Well, that's a little more exciting. Um, and Wayne just gave me tidbits. He, Wayne Sandin kept Wayne Miller on the hook. I was still biting it for that hook. And we kept trying things into the summertime. August 1983, he told us about a brand new unmarked cruiser stolen from Natick Ford, stolen by these guys out of a car dealership that was destined for Randolph, Massachusetts police. But they stole it because they wanted to update their own vehicle, their own personal cruisers with some of the newer parts. And then they dumped it into the Four Point Channel, right near where the fire museum is today. That strip of water that separates South Boston from downtown Boston, they dumped it right into the channel. Wayne Sandin told me about that. And we used the Boston dive team and we recovered the vehicle in August, 1983. We still didn't do anything with it yet. We we're waiting for something else to happen. I was 
waiting to try to catch them in the act of setting a fire. And based on information that Sandin was giving, just tidbits. It didn't really happen. We got a new group supervisor in January 1984 who said, focus on these guys, focus. And we, we had Grubuski being charged now with the receiving the stolen property, with stealing that car and parts on his car that he upgraded from that car. And that was a felony. And we interviewed Grubuski on the night of January 12th, 1984. And I'm not gonna give you the details, folks, if you wanna read it or listen to that story, or maybe when it gets to film, we're trying to get it on film. We're trying to get a documentary, a docudrama or something, a, a six part mini series, something. It's a very dramatic scene, the confession itself. But Bobby confessed that night and I actually had the luxury and the uh, benefit of arresting him uh, early Friday morning, January 13th. We're unlucky for Bobby Friday the 13th lucky for us and we arrested him that morning but then again he couldn't talk to us because he had an attorney in federal court who did not allow us to talk to him again until may that's january the arrest may at which point we wired him 17 times when he cooperated now if you watch um oh some of those morning shows good morning america today show the one that they used uh maybe uh some of the other ones like uh CNN or Fox or stuff like that, but they use uh, Ricky Kleeman, an attorney. He was, she's married to Billy Bratt, who was a multiple chiefs. He was a chief in LA, a chief in New York and a chief in Boston. Um, she's an attorney and she became his attorney. And she said, Bobby, you have to cooperate. And he did, and they wore wire 17 times. And we made phone calls and we had some interesting face-to-face -face meetings with these guys. And Greg himself shot his mouth off so often that uh, he ended up confessing eventually and pled guilty. Um, for the Chronicle episode, which was aired November of uh, two years ago, a year oh, and a half. Um, sorry, not to interrupt. Uh, we do just have like a 10 minute warning. Yep. Because we do close at eight o'clock, right? Exactly. I'm heading in that direction. All right. Awesome. So we asked Greg if he wanted to participate in the Chronicle episode. And he has a different last name nowadays uh, because he was in the witness protection program, but he's out in the streets. And um, he did not want to, even so his face would have been blackened out and it would have changed his voice. But he did answer some emails that were sent to him by the producer of Chronicle. This is his response, and I'll let you formulate your opinion of Greg after reading this. I personally felt bad about the injuries, but you know, anytime you have a I'm sorry, but type of thing, it's never good. Uh, but until the E Street military barracks fire, now when I have an audience of firefighters, I, I, I point this out to them. Most of the injuries were minor in nature. Well, okay, some ceiling fell down on guys and they made it out okay. But how close did you come as a firefighter to serious injury or death in that fire where you had the minor injury, where a guy's legs came through the roof, but he didn't actually get injured too badly. <laughs> Most of the injuries were minor in nature and the members of the group of us foolishly rationalized that the good overrode the bad. In retrospect, that was my greatest regret. I fully believe to this day, uh, here's, it's like another but, I fully believe to this, truly believe that the cutbacks would have been much worse in the passage of the Traeger bill, which was signed by then Governor King here in Massachusetts to give money back to the cities and towns. It got passed and it may have partially been because of these fires, but Greg and his crew are still 35 years later taking credit for getting that passed. It would not have passed would not have happened if it not for our regrettable action some 35 years ago. So it's a very strange relationship I have with this guy. And, uh, you know, he, he helped with the book. He still, if you have questions today that I can't answer, Greg will answer the questions for me if he can. Um, so just to wrap it up, 
we arrested nine guys. The ninth one was not an arsonist. Um, Stackpole came to Grubluski. Grubluski was the first to come in. And Grubluski told these guys, I'm going to go to prison and I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Well, he lied to them too, and we wired him 17 times. But uh, he said, uh, Stackpole came to him and said, we are, remember this guy? He's a friend of ours who lives in uh, Ohio, um, Chris Damon. And Chris has agreed to take you out there and house you and help you get a job out there, et cetera. So Chris, because he agreed to do this, became a co-conspirator. And uh, Bobby never intended to do this, but we had, we had Chris on tape eventually and we had it all on tape. So Chris Damon got a couple of years actually in prison for his, that small part. Uh, Bemis signed an agreement even so he cooperated for 30 years in prison. Now the sentencing guidelines back then were different than now. You were eligible for federal probation parole after 10 years. And Greg testified magnificently in two trials. He was unfazed as a cooperating criminal uh, by the defense. He did a great job. And without him and without Grabluski testifying, uh, the case would not have been one, only two trials, that was Stackpole, the mean son of a gun that he was, and Ray Norton, the Boston firefighter, had a lot to lose by getting convicted. Ray never set a fire. He was only present and pointed out and used his house for meetings and making a device um, conspiracy. So he got four to six years. He's a convicted pedophile today. He used to have a young, a lot of young boys hanging around with him. and when he was like 60 years old, he got convicted finally of playing around with young boys. Uh, Stackpole got 40 years and got out after 22. Wayne Sandin, the guy who gave me that, those tidbits of information, told me about the car being dumped in the water. He never told me, never, ever, today even, about his involvement in 50 of the fires. So here he is just saying, oh, the car got set on fire, building caught on fire. He went to jail for 23 years because he didn't cooperate with us. Um, so Bemis got out after 10, Grabluski after 10, Mark Spenby, who was just a part player, he got uh, four to six. Uh, Joe Gorman eventually testified to, he got four to six. And I don't know who I'm missing. So, but uh, I thank you for your participation. Um, if you do want the book, and if you'd like a signed copy, you can get it from firmbostonburn.com and just click on that. You can get it through. Uh, I will, I actually have them upstairs. Um, and I put them in the envelope the very next day. You can get it at Amazon, you can find it other places online. Um, 50% of uh, any profits I've made over the last 18 months, I probably have donated $6,000 to fire victim charities uh, over the last 18 months. And, um, you know, you only make $4.65 every time you sell a book on Amazon, <laughs> this book. And um, so you don't make a ton and a lot of it has to go back in. I am writing my second book, which is due out this fall short stories, including one up in Jefferson, New Hampshire. Um, we had a serial arsonist up there who set some 20 odd fires. Very interesting story. Um, and I have two bombing cases. I'll tease you with this. 50 year old guy dating a 30 something year old woman and her family hated them and tried to break them up. So Christmas week, 1991, I think it was, we sent six bombs to her family members and four of them went off killing five people. Um, I worked that case out in uh, Western New York. And uh, I have a uh, 46 machine gun case I had, um, plus a couple other gun cases. I almost got buried uh, up in uh, China Lake, up in Maine. Nobody would have ever found me, probably. Um, I can smile about it now. Uh, I, I was petrified the day it could have happened, <laughs> you know. But um, so that's all in the second book, all short stories, the second one, and hopefully be out uh, early fall. So thank you for coming again. Thank you for having me. 
All right. Well, thank you. That again, that was uh, super enlightening, at least for me. I had uh, never heard of that before. Um, and oh, someone just said, I hope uh, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck make a movie out of this. Um, We're trying. Ben Affleck, especially, he's a good Boston boy. He stayed there, <laughs> unlike <laughs> Matt Damon. <laughs> he did. We, we, we have some ends actually with the Wahlbergs and also. Um, I have actually an agent now who doesn't seem to be doing a heck of a lot for me, but um, but uh, we are trying to get something to film. All right, well, um, about to say we might have time for. Oh yeah, someone said the characters are better um, better than fiction, which I mean I agree a lot. And there are a lot of cases where reality is just uh, if it were a movie, you wouldn't believe it, but when it's real, it's that much better. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say we might have time for one quick question. Anyone have anything or are we all set? I just looked at your chats, folks. Thank you for sending those <laughs> notes. And, Thank you. Uh, I enjoy doing it. Uh, again, I just like to see everybody. I, I did see all of you pretty much, except when I had the slides up. I mm -hmm. see you. But I like to see reactions and I like the interactions. But um, thank you again anyway for having me. It's still a pleasure. All righty. Um, and hopefully maybe one day we can have programs in person again. Uh, maybe if you're doing a little tour for your second book, potentially uh, something to keep in mind. <laughs> we will do that. Thank you. All righty. Well, thank, thank you, you everyone. No, oh, sorry. Thank you everyone for coming and have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Take care. Stay, Bye. Safe. Stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye, Liz.